I would like to say how fortunate I feel in being present here in the release of a really extraordinarily important book. And I'd like to congratulate the editors and the authors, the three editors, the Dr. Nandi, Dr. Desayu, and Dr. Nagra, um, for putting together such an extraordinarily rich study which changes our understanding of the nature of the problems that healthcare faces uh, in India today. Um, I think we can think of the book in two different ways. One is a contribution to epistemology, the nature of uh, medical care we have, the nature of health care, health attention that India has and what it does not have and what the problems are. So that is a kind of informing an individual reader of which I was fortunate to be one fairly early since I was reading the article before writing my foreword. But the other is the role that the book plays in generating public discussion. I think one of the reasons that several people have already mentioned that, um, one of the reasons why our health care reform has been slow and we have had these quantum jumps in the wrong direction. Um, I think, uh, I would say, the kind of uh, extraordinary premature privatization of primary health care. Uh, India's record is probably the worst in the world. And even though it began badly, it got worse and worse over the years, and taken particularly a bad turn over the last few years. I think there are many other issues, the corruption issue on which the book concentrates. It concentrates on a lot of things other than corruption too. But the corruption issue is very um, importantly unfolded. I mean, some of the stories, of course, um, uh, many people who are uh, kind of educated uh, middle class know that the, the Medical Council of India has problems know that the pharmaceuticals have corruption issues. But the, the reach of it, the extent of it, and how it affects both the efficiency and the equity of healthcare delivery uh, is brought out in a number of individual studies in this truly um, valuable book. Um, I'm fortunate and well, unfortunate in having been rather involved with medical care. The unfortunate part is that from time to time I get illnesses. When I was very young, I got malignant malaria. Then I got cancer when I was 18. And then I got it again now. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, the fortunate side is that I've also known a lot of doctors uh, and had also taught courses with them, I and mean, I taught fairly regularly in Harvard with a, a very important, very extraordinarily qualified public health uh, doctor, Paul Farmer, yes. uh, that we do every now and then, of course. And I also, I think uh, it was mentioned possibly uh, by Dr. Nagar that um, Michael Farmer, with whom I've also worked, well, I had also emphasized uh, 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 the importance of public health care, and I've been fortunate to work with him, not only in that commission, but in other things too. I mean, you can also see there are two different aspects of medical uh, attention. Paul Farmer's attention has been mostly on health care, whereas Michael Marmot's attention has been mostly on social determinants of health, why inequality itself can generate um, medical problem. Not because an inequality is, uh, uh, is, a, is a factor in a direct way in the body in which, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, fat intake or, 
or, or dark uh, in your throat might be. But it generates behavior pattern for the people who are down under and sat upon of frustration leading to over drinking, over smoking, uh, lack of exercise, not finding time to exercise and so on, um, and, and so forth. And, and, and I think these two put together, and since I've been working with both of them, it's very important for me to understand that there are two aspects of healthcare we're looking. One is where healthcare is, uh, is, is, the, is the immediate issue, and the other is where it's the come through social behavior and how the, how, how the world proceeds. Now, um, I mentioned I've been unfortunate having illnesses, but fortunate too, because I thought that I, in some ways I wouldn't be here today, but for having, uh, if I didn't have doctor friends, I was staying in a YMCA hospital, I had a little swelling in my mouth and I went to my doctor, and he said, it's nothing. And I went to three doctors, including I went to the Carmichael Hospital. Uh, I think it's called Algi Corner. Uh, I went there and stood in a queue. And then eventually, after three hours, I suddenly saw. And again, it is me completely when I said, uh, you know, I think I have cancer. And with, meanwhile, I had, next door to me was a medical student, fourth year. And I said, uh, I asked him, could he get me some books on cancer? of the mouth, and he got me some. And I had some notion by then that I had squamous cell carcinoma. It's purely morphologically looking at what it looked like and the, uh, the tendency in this region for that to happen quite often. So I told my doctor that I thought I had a squamous cell carcinoma. And you know how doctors react if you tell them what you think you have. So his reaction was, to say, oh, we, we must take that very seriously. But other than Corpusfell carcinoma, no, carcinoma, what other serious illnesses do you have? <laughs> <laughs> so there I was being put on the map. And then he offered to cut it out immediately. And of course, I wouldn't, I, by then I knew enough from my uh, reading of the of these uh, medical books that that would be a very bad thing. And then I had to go to the Chittaranjan Hospital, which had been opened only a few years earlier. I'm talking about 52. And, um, and I had one of the early cases of um, um, uh, radio mold radiation and there. In those days, they didn't have uh, the, the, the X-ray, which I have now. Now, I think basically, had I not been vigilant, uh, that would have been it, I think. Um, and recently I had um, um, uh, cancer of the prostate again, slightly in this case, not such a hard problem, but I had to persuade my urologist that really, even though the PSA is low, I would like to have an MRI done. And, and they said, well, it's not quite high enough. I said, well, I want to catch it before it's high, because high means it's beginning to spread, and I want to get it when it's low, and I can still get some treatment. I have just emerged from nine weeks of every weekday medical uh, irradiation, uh, what is called IMRT these days. And, uh, you know, I, since at the moment I'm in remission, and I hope uh, it stays that way, I'm afraid I don't believe in the value of prayer, so that praying is not available to me. But I hope that, that, that I, work, I can do all those things that I can do to, to keep it like that. Um, but it's a fight. And here, by the way, I think um, one of the things really important is doctor-patient conversation and, and to be able to get attention. And one would think that does not happen in private healthcare, even when they a poor peasant manages to get some attention is any kind of seriousness as to what it is in the mind. I think uh, it came up in the discussion that a lot of the bankruptcy comes from from the uh, from uh, medical treatment, which people can't afford private medical treatment because uh, amazingly in India we don't have free primary health care, which is entirely affordable within India's GDP totally affordable. We don't do it. 
but we won't even talk with them as to how much expensive it would be, why should I have to go somewhere else, a friend of the doctor who had a private clinic where an x-ray could be taken, all, all these discussions are completely out. Now the fortunate, of course, in being hypochondriac, hypochondriac and I have been close friends for a very long time. And I think it goes back to my school days. I remember, I mean, I think I got probably carried to the extreme. Because one day I diagnosed that I had, I think I had cholera, I told him. And this chap, uh, he said, no, you didn't have, don't have cholera, I said, the doctor. Uh, and he said, um, some of the gastroenteritis disease. And then he said, among other things, he said, well, I've noticed that cholera fed patients are usually very optimistic. And you uh, seem very pessimistic. So I think that is a further evidence you don't have cholera. So I got very consoled by it and went home and felt that I was wrong and began feeling optimistic. And then, of course, immediately I came down with the thought that perhaps I do have cholera since I am feeling optimistic right now. So when I went back to the doctor, he said, you didn't really want to have many more conversations with me. I fully understand that. But usually the conversations are shut off much earlier than that. And I think that is one of the things I would like to add to the, to the, to the richness of the book, that the, the need, uh, even without a completely non-corrupt doctor, often don't like the conversational aspect that is very important for us, uh, the patients. I think basically what the book does is to treat doctors and patients as human beings. Cross the ability is a human folly. Uh, it's very easy to be corrupt. We all do it somewhere or another. I, I might use university stationery to write a private letter. It may not be very big corruption, but you could call it that. But given temptation, things can happen. And so there, it is an economic story also behind corruption. And we have to not only make an appeal to, to high morality, which is a very important thing to do, I don't deny that, but also create conditions where the incentive for corruptibility isn't so much there. There's also the question of public discussion to be very well. And I think one of the antidotes to corruption, one of the uh, ways of stopping corruption, is public discussion. And the absence of it is just appalling that people become, it, it, the whole thing becomes so blase that people don't even talk about that very much. Um, Dr. Bird, I refer to the story, which I also read in this morning's paper, about the American um, representative objecting to the uh, resolution about the importance of breastfeeding on, in the interest of um, commercial producers of breast milk substitutes. It's an appalling story, but it figured in one paragraph and went away and nowhere else did this come up. It's a, it's a gigantic story, because breast fading is something which affects the whole of humanity, and the, the barriers to it is something which is a total, um, um, uh, it's, a, it's a real a good example of a failure of human rights that uh, all of us have an interest in. So I think it's a, Enormous, um, with great, enormous gratefulness, I thank on behalf of all of us here, the authors of this book and the editors of the book, for bringing together for us um, discussions that are really turn the, turn it, uh, make us understand what's going on. And if there is going to be a change, it has to come to the public discussion. Public discussion is very central. Not all public discussion is good. And sometimes we get the same phrase repeated again and again. For a while I was, I think at the height of Tony Blair's, I mean he was in many ways quite a good prime minister, but 
the all everything that being discussed there, we heard that it will be solved by public-private partnership. They can just inform with us again and again. And I was very pleased when one of the English papers carried a cartoon where there is a man lying on the on a, obviously a patient lying on the bed, and there is someone leaning over him. You should recognize it's an anesthetist who says, "I will." slowly going on, go on explaining to you public-private partnership until you start feeling drowsy <laughs> and then fall asleep. No, I think there is a kind of discussion that can make us fall asleep, but there is a kind of discussion that makes us awake. And I'm delighted that this is what that gives us good reason to be awake and get going and get something done. So with that, I on behalf of all of you, I thank the authors and editors. <laughs>